Welcome to Electro Online. A big part of understanding our solar system is knowing the age of the solar system. And in order to help us determine the age of the solar system, we have to go and rely on understanding the radioactive decay in the heavy elements. Anything beyond lead 206. 206 is one of the isotopes of lead, and the isotope of lead that's 206 is a stable isotope. So that lead will be around for millions, billions of years and will not change. But anything heavier than that, anything above the periodic table with more protons or neutrons than lead 206, those elements are not stable. So we have what we call decay series. And so here we have what we call the uranium-238 decay series. The numbers in front of the letter indicate the number of nucleons and the number of protons in the element. So U stands for uranium. 92 means there's 92 protons and there's a total of 238 nuclear particles which means 238 minus 92 which is 146 is the number of neutrons in that nucleus. So imagine a nucleus that has 146 neutrons and 92 protons. Those are not stable. They tend to break apart. They tend to shoot out a particle and change itself slowly over time from one element to another until it becomes lead 206 and that's called the decay series. It's a known series. We've been able to study it, we understand it, and we know how long it takes for one element to turn into another element. That's called the half-life of a radioactive material. And what we mean by half-life is let's say that we have a radioactive material and let's say that the half-life, we write it as T sub 1 half, let's say that's equal to 10 days. What does that mean? Well, if we have a clump of a particular radioactive material and the half-life is 10 days, then after 10 days, half of the material will have turned into another, another sort of material, another element, or another isotope, and the rest of it will still be the original. Then of what's remaining after another 10 days, half of that will decay, and now you're only left with one quarter of its original amount. And then after another 10 days, another half of that will be gone, and now we're down to one eighth of the original radioactive element. So by knowing the half-life, we know how quickly it changes from one element or one isotope to another. For example, the half-life of uranium-238 is four and a half billion years. Yes, for some elements, it's a very long time, which means after four and a half billion years, whatever uranium-238 was there in the Earth's crust or in the Earth's interior will have decayed to the next element, in this case, thorium, and so only half of that will be left over. Now, how does that happen? Well, it turns out the decay series happens when either the nucleus shoots out an alpha particle, which is the nucleus of a helium atom, which has two protons and two neutrons, or it shoots out a beta particle, which is basically an electron. Now, that's kind of odd when you think about having a nucleus that only has neutrons and protons. How can something that only has neutrons and protons shoot out a beta particle, an electron? Well, what happens is, one of the neutrons will eject an electron and turn itself into a proton. It's pretty remarkable. So a, a neutron can shoot out a negative charge, become positively charged, so a, a, a neutral particle will then become positively charged. And yes, that can happen. A neutron can shoot out a beta particle, an electron, and turn itself into a proton. So let's look at the decay series. So we start out from uranium-238, that can shoot out an alpha particle, on average, every four and a half billion years, half of it will have decayed into the next element, which is thorium, which is, has four less nuclear particles, because an alpha particle has four particles, and two less protons, because an alpha particle has two protons. So then the thorium has a half-life of 24 days, it will shoot out a beta particle, a beta particle means that one of the neutrons turns into a proton, so now you have 91 protons, which means you now have protactinium. Protactinium has a half-life of 70 seconds. It shoots out the beta particle and turns itself back into uranium. Not the same uranium we had over here because this uranium is uranium-234, not 238. It has four less neutrons. But it's also radioactive. Half-life is 250,000 years. It shoots out an alpha particle and turns itself back into thorium. But not the same thorium we had over here because this is thorium-30, not 234. It has four less neutrons. Of course, it has the same number of protons, which is what makes it thorium. Then thorium half-life is about 75,000 years. It shoots out an alpha particle and turns itself into radon. Or I should say radium, not radon. Radon gas is over here. This is called radium. 
Radium is radioactive. It has a half-life of 1,600 years, and it turns itself into radon gas when it shoots out an alpha particle. Now, radon gas is something that is around in the ground, of course, because all these radioactive elements are in the soil and in, in the crust of the Earth. And since it turns into a gas, it tends to seep to the surface. Now, radon gas has a very short half-life of 3.8 days. Now, wherever there are places in the United States and other places in the world where radon gas seeps to the surface, it can actually seep into the basement of houses and be part of the atmosphere, the air in the house. And of course, since it's radioactive, what does it do? It shoots out alpha particles. It can be harmful to us. And so some places we have to have ventilation systems that clear out that radon gas from homes and from, home, uh, from the basement of homes so that they don't, you don't breathe that radioactive radon gas. But from radon gas, it turns itself into polonium. Polonium has a half-life of 3.1 months. Remember, it, again, it does it by shooting out an alpha particle. Each time you shoot out an alpha particle, the number of nucle nucleons drops by 4, and the number of protons drops by 2. After that, it turns itself into lead, but not stable lead. It is radioactive lead. It has the same number of protons as a stable lead, but it has 8 more neutrons, so it's unstable, has a half-life of about 27 months. That lead then shoots out the beta particle, which means one of the neutrons turns into a proton, which means you go from 82 protons to 83 pro protons, which makes it into bismuth. Now, bismuth can change in two ways. It can either shoot out an alpha particle or it can shoot out a beta particle. So it turns out the half-life is 20 months of shooting out an alpha particle and 20 months for shooting out a beta particle. If it shoots out the beta particle, it becomes polonium, if it shoots out an alpha particle, it becomes thallium. But both of those are radioactive. Thallium shoots out beta particles. Polonium shoots out alpha particles to turn themselves back into lead. Not the lead that we had over here, but the lead with four less uh, neutrons. But it's still radioactive. That lead will shoot out beta particles with a half-life of 22 years and turn itself into bismuth because it has one more proton, and bismuth will shoot out, bismuth 210 will shoot out a beta particle and turn itself into polonium. And the final step is that polonium will shoot out an alpha particle, shed another four nucleons, two of them being protons, and that turns itself into lead, which is stable with 82 protons and, 200, and 206 total nuclear particles, which means 18 plus 6, that's 124 neutrons. Now, since we understand this process very well, and then sometimes we will find rocks in the crust, and then we can go ahead and analyze those rocks, and we'll find certain one of these elements in that rock in certain proportions. The proportions of which element that we find can actually tell us how old that rock is. You can, of course, see that there's going to be a lot of different elements there, different isotopes. It's not an easy task to take a rock and date it using this particular decay series, but it can be done. There's some other decay series that are more convenient for rock dating, and I'll show you in the next videos what, which ones they are, and I'll show you some examples of how we actually apply this technique to find the age of the rocks. Using that, we've been able to date the rocks that we brought back from the moon. We've been able to, to date meteors that have landed on the Earth, meteorites that we've been able to analyze and date as well, and we've been able to date rocks all around the Earth. In some places, some of the rocks are very old, not quite going all the way back to the beginning of the solar system, but several billion years old. But the real key to understanding the solar system is, is discovering rocks that we found on the moon, and then also rocks that we find that have come in from space that probably came from the asteroid belt, left over from the formation of the solar system, and those rocks have been dated to almost 4.6 billion years. And that's why we think the age of the solar system is around 4.6 billion years. More or less about 4.54, 4.56, but just let's call it 4.6. Round it off. And so by knowing this process and by able to analyze the, the ratio of these particular radioactive elements, we've been able to figure out the age of the solar system. And again, the aid in understanding how the solar system came about. And that's how we did it.